Oh, right, okay, cut his head off, cut his arms off, and because he's only a kid, we'll just have his fingers. Hello and welcome. In the Game of Thrones, you win or you don't win. It's, it's quite a lot like most games. This is a video about a video game about the Game of Thrones. Roll the video. First of all, though, a couple of caveats. This will be a discussion about the game. However, it will also have some more serious spoilers about Game of Thrones itself. So if you're not up to date with the TV show, then you might not, you know, just stay away. Goodbye. And largely the comparisons here can be made between this and Telltale's best piece of work to date, which of course was series one of Wallace and Gromit. Oh no, I'm joking. Although apparently it was all right. No, uh, The Walking Dead. So what was it that The Walking Dead nailed? Well, you had these kind of spur of the moment choices that were in hopeless situations, you know? And this hopelessness gelled with the game's biggest problem, which was the fact that the decisions you made were effectively pointless. But futility was the perfect fit for the setting, you know? You got humanity on the verge of extinction, and it's very unlikely that anyone will escape a grim fate. And the thing was that who you chose to be and who you choose to be when faced with mortality is an interesting choice in itself. It's one of those odd cases where the results of the actions that you take aren't actually as important as the intention behind the decisions that you make. Because in life, I think when you're faced with true horror, that's all you've really got, you know? The knowledge that you did your best, how things pan out, doesn't really matter because sometimes things are just going to pan out in one way. How you feel about the way that you handled it in the run-up to that is kind of the most important thing, and that's something that I think really worked within the framework of The Walking Dead. Despite the set-in-stone narrative, The Walking Dead systems worked so well because of its severely expendable cast. You know, what the characters you met thought of you always felt important at that moment, but what really mattered in the long run was how you felt about yourself. The mechanical irrelevance of the choice was in itself irrelevant. What mattered was the knowledge that, when put under pressure and forced to make a snap decision, that was the decision that you'd chosen to make. Perhaps a decision that was mostly based on what was best for the characters, but also a reflection of you. The Walking Dead created a big, guilty mirror that left you questioning what sort of person you'd be if faced with such drastic, ongoing tragedies. The real stroke of genius was, of course, Clementine, cruelly forcing you to remember the importance of morality at points at which it frankly felt like trying to be a good person simply wasn't possible. Game of Thrones is a very different beast, and it's smart of Telltale to start the series at a point at which hope is at a shattering low. In the context of the story in the books and the TV show, the impact of this is mostly seen in the remnants of House Stark, but of course, the Red Wedding in the context of the world had far wider implications. With everyone who cares about the North and the well-being of the North and the status quo that was set now mostly dead or on the run or locked up, you got a huge chunk of Westeros' geography which is now placed in the hands of a dangerous nutter. In the context of Westeros, it's a massive shake-up. In the south, these shifts in power have been more common, with houses being destroyed or diminished or entirely swallowed up whenever a major shift in power has occurred, largely because these lands are desirable, people want them. North, not so much. But the proximity of many of these houses to King's Landing makes outright foul play much less likely. It's why we see most of the murders occurring through poison or rigged jousting tournaments, etc. But the North is really different because of the distance, you know? If you kill the right people at the right time, you can effectively do whatever you want to. I mean, sure, they might be able to get to King's Landing and tell them, but it's a long way to King's Landing, and sooner or later, you'll probably be chased down. But the second factor that's important about the North of Westeros is that the South don't care about it, you know? Northern families don't appear in court every other week to stir up trouble and complain. And because they aren't deemed to be players in the ongoing political game that King's Landing wrestles with, the North simply isn't on the radar that much. And this, of course, is why Bruce Bolton wants it. You know, he's a dark man with dark hobbies and a genuinely terrifying son, existing in a realm in which nobody really cares 
about is kind of a perfect situation for him. So that's where we're dropped in with Telltale's Game of Thrones, into the shoes of a remote northern family having to deal with this huge seismic shift. Their liege lord and father is dead, their lands are now controlled by a man who skins people alive, and the only people who can possibly help you are the same people that you were just trying to knock off the throne. So you might not be dealing with zombies, but damn, things still seem pretty futile to me. So sure, on paper, Game of Thrones is a perfect fit just because of the way it tends to murder characters at a comparative rate to The Walking Dead, but really, it's the choice of setting and the point in the timeline at which we enter the world that makes Telltale's formula shine here. But the use of characters is very different too. Everyone you meet in The Walking Dead served a purpose, either as a simple cog in a narrative set piece, i.e. this guy's gonna die or this guy's gonna try and kill you, or as a reflection of an archetype from the real world. A big emphasis here was always on family, both in terms of how far people will go to protect those they love, and how they then deal with the grief of loss and living on with that. But upon meeting these characters, they were almost always unknown quantities. Their backstories and motivations unfolded as we played through the adventure, giving us a better picture of who they were. Still, the situations here were always simple and human. These were just everyday people doing what they had to do to survive. You didn't need any prior knowledge to enjoy The Walking Dead. You just had to be a human with feelings, as opposed to a robot with arms that are made of swords. You're not one of them, are you? I don't like them. Game of Thrones is really different because it hinges on prior player knowledge, something that games don't tend to do very often. Mostly games just have a kind of somewhat rigid system with single protagonists going through the narratives in a kind of first person or third person nature where we know the same amount as the characters, even if the characters often behave in a way that's notably quite stupid. This is something that's far more common though in films, TV shows and books, especially Game of Thrones which jumps between multiple characters all the time and often has you in a situation as a reader where you know loads of things that the characters don't have a clue about. Games don't do this very often, so it's kind of unique and fun to have that here. Admittedly, I was concerned prior to playing it that the use of known characters and leaning on known characters would make it a kind of silly cameo carousel, which was a concern I expressed on an episode of Daft Souls not long ago. Simply because these characters are untouchable. You can't kill these characters. You can't do much with them. You know, you can't knock them off the rails too much because so much of this story has already been set in stone. But so far, the use of these known faces has been impeccable just because of the roles that you've been cast. To be blunt, the people you control are weak and insignificant. And because of that, it doesn't matter that the characters from the TV show that you bump into are untouchable, because you haven't really got any hope of touching them anyway. But what I especially like is the fact that these weak, insignificant characters come in three distinct Game of Thrones flavours. First up, pig farmer flavour. Sorry mate, your life isn't worth dick. Handy lady flavour. You're in King's Landing, that must give you a bit of sway, right? No? Oh, you, you're a handmaiden for Lady Marjorie, and she's not actually the Queen yet, and any requests for help you make are gonna have to go through Joffrey. That's... oh... Uh. Mini Milk Lord flavour. You're a Lord, the big boss, El Grande... Cheese. Except you're also a child, and you've got no army, really, and uh, you've got a bunch of people who do have armies who've just decided that they want your land, and they're friends with the people who have just killed your... Ah, this is... Ooh. So the clever thing here is that we're provided with three distinct settings that each place you firmly on the back foot, but in three very different ways. Mr. Many Milk faces the tough realities of politics and trying to remain stoic in the face of danger, Handy Maidy Lady has to navigate the backstabbing hall of mirrors that represents King's Landing, treading carefully with every word whilst desperately trying to find a way to help your family. And Captain Unlucky the Pig Farmer just has to deal with the reality that his life doesn't mean anything to anyone at all, and everyone he meets is probably going to treat him very badly. And that doesn't cover everything about the setting of Game of Thrones, but it's a pretty clean overview of a lot of the spectrum. Although I'm very, very sure this is going to be expanded upon in the future with new characters to play. If we don't get to be the hot-headed brother who was exiled from Westeros ages ago, then I'll eat my crown, because that is definitely, definitely going to happen. 
But the excitement and tension that comes from playing these familiar roles is largely hinged on the knowledge we have about the characters that we're dealing with. Realising that your best bet for survival is probably bending the knee to Roos Bolton and letting him into your hall as a guest is genuinely terrifying. That's not, that doesn't seem like a good idea, but I don't have any better ideas. Oh, God. In short, the opening episode of Telltale's Game of Thrones thing makes you feel like you're actually a player in the aforementioned game. But you aren't a player who's doing very well. In fact, you're a player who who might be about to lose completely. The aim in The Walking Dead was simple. Keep Lee alive, keep Clementine alive. In this, the aim is a bit wider. You know, you've got to try and keep your whole family alive, not just in terms of actually having a mother that breathes, etc., but trying to keep your land, keep the tradition. Ah, it's all maybe going to fall apart. And jumping between different members of your family, your rapidly diminishing family, allows for the overall arc of the series to be a lot more brutal about wiping out characters in which you actually control, which is an interesting new one for the series. You can actually just have characters that you're playing that die, potentially, but also creates a sense of friction between this desire for self-preservation and the needing to work towards a larger aim. It seems like that's going to be a major part of the series. How far are you willing to go in terms of putting these characters into danger in order to try and protect the rest of the group? Because there's a real feeling here that sticking your neck out too far could easily see your head getting locked clean off. But at the same time, failing to act could also just see your entire family being wiped off the map forever. So it's a tricky one. Obviously though, as with all Telltale games, the whole thing is just an elaborate illusion. It's not real. You know, regardless of how you approach episode one, the conclusion roughly pans out to be the same, and it's pretty obvious that that's probably gonna be the same all the way throughout the series. That's just kind of what Telltale do. But the sense of wider consequence and the fear you experience when making these choices feels weighty and real. It's a trick that sooner or later is going to get tired and it will stop working, but here it still very much works. One section in particular quietly hands you the opportunity to attempt something audacious that would definitely cause substantial trouble. I didn't have the guts to go anywhere near it, but even being faced with a temptation to do this caused me to actually physically freeze in fear. This is a beautiful new thing for the series. Rather than having a snap decision, are you going to do this or this? This was just kind of something placed in front of you. An idea. You could maybe do this. Oh, very spicy, very nice. It's stunning stuff so far, and it's a very strong foundation for the rest of the series. I've yet to check out Tales of the Borderland, but I felt that despite a promising start, the Wolf Among Us quickly lost its way, putting an emphasis on choosing between being reasonable and calm or being outwardly violent, which was a system that made perfect sense for the character, but was much harder to relate to as a player. You know, dealing with the consequences and guilt of pointless violence isn't something I've had to think about for a long time. You know, I've kind of... It was a long time ago since I was a teenager. But also the flippancy with which they used the lore of the world to render the sucker punch ending of episode one, which was killer, I can't deny. But they kind of rendered that whole thing obsolete with a bit of twisting to the lore, left a sour taste that the game's stellar style and other good features just weren't able to wash away. Game of Thrones, though, really does feel different, perhaps simply because it isn't trying to do anything mechanically that different. You know, you've got standard QTE action bits, you've got a little bit of posturing about between the scenes, but no for those puzzles, none of the puzzles that slowed down the pace of The Walking Dead. You've got this pure focus on narrative and tight pacing with a setting that mirrors the bleak sense of futility that we've seen in The Walking Dead, but also adds a flavour of its own and perfectly kind of reflects the Game of Thrones setting in an interesting way. Add to that the fact that you've got multiple characters, which should keep you on your toes about when people are going to kick the bucket. And finally, I also love the fact that the good and bad elements are far less clear here. Some of the good characters are very tiresome, some of the bad characters are kind of fun. It never feels like the noble answer is going to be necessarily a good one. And I mean, anyone who's familiar with Game of Thrones should be well aware of that by now. And I mean, episode one asks you to choose between putting your favour in the hands of a very wise, sensible chap who's not too keen on violence, or a man who's very keen on violence, but a little hot-headed. And both of these are terrible decisions. You don't want a guy who's gonna go mad and punch people for no reason, but Mr. Wise would have been fine if things weren't terrible, but this is a time for action. Ah, there isn't a good option, everything's bad. 
In The Walking Dead, you have this sense that people have to temporarily forget about some of their morals in order to survive, whereas in Game of Thrones, you have to survive constantly, which means a lot of people just have never really had any morals, and they fare a damn sight better than the people who do. This shift in the nature of morality means it's a lot more fun to just be a bit of a bastard because you don't feel like you're breaking any moral code, you're just doing what people have to do in this world. And secondly, it means it's more of a role-playing experience. It's less about you soul-searching and being like, oh, would I have done that if I was a liege lord of a land that mostly produced trees to make wooden shields? Because no, that's quite, that's quite a difficult mindset to get into. It's probably not going to be a problem you have to face in real life in the same way that, you know, who would you protect your friends or your family against zombies? That's like, yeah, I can get that. It is more of a role-playing experience, but for a Game of Thrones fan, and a Game of Thrones fan who doesn't know when they're going to get their next hit of actual new stuff. Come on, George, write some, write some books, please. Then it's great. It's really good. You should check it out. As I've already said, there are some decisions they've made with the art direction. I made a video about last week. You should check that out. My God, it actually makes me angry. Urgh. Apart from that, very, very good. And if you're a Game of Thrones fan, you should check it out. Bye! Wow! <laughs> Singing, I love Game of Thrones, so put another man in a dungeon, maybe. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm very sorry. I'm not sorry. Bye.